Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Idea to Value podcast. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Dr. Shama Raman. She's a scientist, artist, and entrepreneur uh, who's got a long history uh, investigating the neuroscience behind creative mental models and how we can use modern technology to enhance people's creative capabilities. Dr. Raman, it's wonderful having you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Uh, so for people who don't know about you and your work, can you give us a brief background as to your journey around creativity? Absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, um, I have an interest in both the sciences and the arts. And uh, there came a point in my life where I definitely didn't want to choose. And so I thought I would do an interdisciplinary PhD and use the sciences and the arts um, in a way that was symbiotic with each other. So I wanted to look at the neuroscience in particular uh, of creativity. And um, if it, you know, by, by nature, it became a very interdisciplinary PhD um, because I was looking at um, sort of mental models. I was looking at psychology. I was looking at philosophy. Um, I was even looking at computational creativity models. And essentially what I wanted to do is to see um, if there was any sort of, uh, you know, like physiological underpinnings to uh, different types of creativity, different stages of creativity, different, um, you know, tools and techniques, um, and of our experience of, of the different states of creative thinking, um, whether it was all very subjective or whether there was also an objective uh, neuronal um, underpinning to the whole thing. So that's where that whole sort of journey began. Um, and yeah, uh, from there, I now have a startup where we are creating uh, digital collaborators to essentially enhance your creative thinking using AI um, as, as, as that sort of creative sparker and helper to guide you through these different um, sort of mental modes uh, of thinking and, and, and uh, utilizing different um, tips, techniques, and tools in a very interactive way that um, AI now has that capacity to do. So um, apparently that's called neuro design. <laughs> I got told <laughs> last, uh, last year. So, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. And uh, you're one of those people that I, I love to speak to who've got sort of direct experience with the science of creativity. So let's start there. When you were doing your research, what exactly were you researching? What were you trying to investigate and what did you find out? <laughs> um, so um, my, my favorite arts, uh, or I shouldn't say favorite, but the one that I find myself, uh, you know, veering into um, rather more easily than others is music. Um, and so I was looking at uh, piano players, both within jazz and classical, and looking at the different types of creativity that underpins both of those. Um, and in my, um, let's say, explorations, I came across uh, you know, a, a, a framework of thinking by a, a guy called Wallace, who I believe in 1926, um, roundabout, uh, went and interviewed hundreds of eminent creatives, um, which I was very pleased to see didn't just include the usual suspects, aka musicians or artists, but also scientists and, um, you know, chemists, mathematicians, architects, all sorts. Um, and, um, I was trying to see if, if any of that um, sort of framework very broadly that he suggested would also apply within um, musical creativity um, and uh, whether, yeah, whether there was um, brain activity that had like signature patterns that would um, correlate with any of these sort of different stages or types of creativity. So just, just to give you an example, um, there's such a thing called divergent creativity so you might have come across that when you're when you're brainstorming the idea being you know there's no right answer and you have lots and lots and lots of ideas um maybe in a very very short space of time in music that could translate to possibly um improvising um so you might be given sort of like you know one stimulus and from there off you go 
Um, and, you know, uh, to a listener, you, there might be some semblance to the original stimulus, but you're, you're essentially allowed to make up your own rules, uh, especially if it's free jazz, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's another one called uh, convergent thinking. So this is actually something that might be um, uh, used more often in maths, uh, where there's uh, maybe only one <laughs> correct answer, or at least very few. So you might have come across using that uh, when you're trying to solve a riddle, for example. Um, but also, um, you know, a, a, a sort of um, parallel could be within classical um, piano playing where, you know, the composer uh, has written some notes, you know, for you to actually follow. So it's not like off you go. <laughs> These are the ones that you need to be coming, you know, kind of converging towards, but there's still creativity towards that because it's how did you come there, you know, um, you know, to, to, to that path, like uh, how did you decide to emotionally convey something, say, or, you know, maybe there's some spaces and pauses. There's a lot of artistry behind that. And, um, you know, uh, I was essentially also um, looking at the, the sort of broader sphere of creativity, like looking at, you know, people like Wallace um, and kind of seeing, you know, uh, where is the space for creative exploration or research, which is one of the very first um, uh, stages in, in any creative process, whether you're trying to write a song or whether you're trying to, you know, solve that next mathematical or scientific, um, you know, discovery, you need to do some research <laughs> and, and preparation. And um, then it comes the, the, the sexier part that everybody knows, which is the incubation uh, part, aka you go for a walk or you have a shower and then suddenly Suddenly there's Eureka, which is the third stage. Um, but there is research that shows that actually, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of quality of preparation that you do, aka the more research that you do, uh, the more likely it is that you are to have a more quality um, or higher quality incubation phase um, and hence leads to possibly a better idea. And what is incubation? It's um, essentially all of that um, data that you've put in your head, uh, you know, uh, sort of cogitating um, under the, the, the conscious uh, sort of awareness. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you're no longer working on it. You're just not aware that you're working on it. <laughs> as far as your brain is concerned, it's definitely working on it. Uh, but different brain um, networks uh, come, come into play at that point. So you move from like a very focused state um, where you're doing a lot of your learning to a very defocused state. And um, this is where the default mode network comes on, um, which, um, a lot of people have associated to mind wandering or daydreaming, um, which in this case for creativity is really, really important um, because what your brain's really doing is that it's, you know, traveling from this to, to this to, to this and then kind of going, oh, you know what? Maybe there's some sort of connection here and maybe that's when that sort of pattern all clicks together and then you have your eureka moment. And um, from that angle, you know, I think then you reach something called flow, which 1926 Wallace didn't come across necessarily, although he might have been aware of it. But um, 1975, uh, Tsitsen Mihai uh, coined. So he was the father of positive psychology and um, found that when uh, people were engaged in these sort of creative activities or in something that they're very passionate about, they get into this state of mind, um, which has a, a bunch of properties associated with it, um, that he then coined flow. And this is definitely something that shows up in musical creativity, definitely um, when, when, when you're improvising for sure, um, and most possibly also in it within classical. Um, stop me if I'm waffling, tell me if I'm going on the oh, oh, <laughs> direction. Um, and so for me, it's very, very um, interesting to see how one can use creative thinking to get to that flow state. Um, now, the flow state is something that um, people talk about a lot more when it comes to um, athleticism or performance. Um, but really, it's something that can happen in any line of work that you do. And, and, and these sort of like the properties that come with it are mental flexibility. So being able to see things from lots of different angles, not getting fixated on only one way of looking at things, which actually in psychological terms is, is um, termed stress. Um, and so it's kind of anti-stress. Um, and if you think about it, mental flexibility is, is the essence of creative thinking. Um, you know, being able to think about lots of different, um, you know, purposes for something or lots of different uh, ways of looking at something, coming up with new ideas altogether. Um, but it's also characterized by this sort of um, simultaneous, uh, um, let's just say, uh, a 
ability to see the bigger picture, having a really broad attention to something, but also being able to have um, attention to detail, to the little sort of the, the narrower things. So this is where it differs from focus, which is a little bit more tunnel vision, a bit more sort of, you know, razor sharp like that. And, um, you know, a, a, a cool way of looking at it, again, if you look at it from sports, you know, if you're a footballer, you need to know what you're doing at the same time as where you are in the, you know, the field at the same time as knowing, you know, what your teammates are doing. Um, a similar analogy would be, you know, if you are a public speaker, you need to know exactly what you've just said, what you're saying right now, how you have the audience reacting to you. Um, you know, you, Nick, how you're reacting to me right now. <laughs> now that I'm a public speaker right now, this is a very strange time during uh, COVID. So everybody's podcasting, I suppose. <laughs> um, to, to being a musician, you know, when you're in a band, you need to know what you're doing and what the band's doing and how the audience is reacting. So all of these things, as you can see, um, are, are in different you know, disciplines maybe, but, but the, the experience of it are very similar. And I think the, the experience, especially when you're in the moment of creativity and uh, when you're trying to figure out what, what enhances it and what doesn't, you talked about one of the aspects earlier, which is this incubation phase uh, that uh, a lot of people think is where the best ideas come from. Um, lots of people say they get their best ideas in the shower or in the, uh, in a time when they're exercising or walking and uh, effectively when they're not actually focused on the challenge in front of it. Um, and uh, there's been research over the last couple of decades about different brain states, whether or not they're uh, relaxed or hyper-focused or stressed. Um, what's your view on, on the research behind what actually enhances these different types of creativity throughout mental models? Um, I think the very first thing to do is to recognize that creativity is not one thing um, and, you know, it has different mental models and the best thing is to learn how to harness those different mental sort of modes and models um, at the right time for the right thing that you're doing, which sounds like a super vague answer, but actually, you know, it's, it's you know, to just to give you an example, like if you are, for example, trying to come up with lots of different ideas for something, it is very useful not to have that critic that you have uh, sitting there analyzing every single idea that you come up with. It's really good to put that critic on, on ice, <laughs> you know? And then, um, like you mentioned, this incubation period, um, it's all well and good, you know, um, you know, ha having that sort of bolt of inspiration when you're not thinking about something, but uh, to begin with, you need something to not think about which means you do need to do a lot of research and exploration and feed your mind um, for it to, to work on it in the first place. So, you know, some of the things that, you know, I used to do was like, you know, if I, it, it, this is just as relevant in, in learning, I would say, is like, you know, if I have an exam the next day or, you know, I have a, a grant that I have to put in, like I did today, by the way, I went to bed at four in the morning. I did not, <laughs> hence the coffee still. I don't necessarily uh, uh, advocate that. But, you know, I knew that had I woken up without having done something before, I would be, you know, a million miles behind what I should be. So the, the point being, I would do the preparation and then use my sleeping to do my incubation. And I know that I would be ready to go in the morning, you know? Absolutely. So let's let's uh, sort of take your journey to the next step. We've talked about a lot of the research that you've done. Um, I understand you're doing some very interesting stuff uh, right now when it comes to helping people use what you've learned in new ways to enhance their own creativity. Yeah. So um, I am the founder of a startup called NeuroCreate. Kind of does what it says on the tin. <laughs> Um, in that we are using this knowledge of, of the neuroscience underpinning creativity uh, to help people create, essentially. And um, this has come about in a very opportune moment where we have a technology called AI, which is allowing um, a lot of interactive um, and real-time processing of patterns, essentially. Um, and instead of looking at it just as some sort of automating you know, device or, or um, yeah, essentially just something that replicate stuff, we thought, wouldn't it be interesting for the AI itself to be your personal creative collaborator um, that can essentially prompt you and spark you to, to come up with more creative ideas by taking you through these different stages of creative thinking, helping you go into these different mental modes that are necessary um, you know, in order for you to come up with that next groundbreaking idea. So it's loosely following Wallace's um, framework um, where you know, he, he posited the, these four stages um, the three of which we just talked about, one being the creative exploration research 
preparation, um, the incubation phase, which basically is when your brain is trying to come up with lots of patterns. Um, and so we are uh, utilizing the AI to be like your second brain in this case, and also trying to help find lots of patterns, which can then present you and then you can make your own mind up and hopefully then getting you to, you know, your eureka moment. Um, so what we're doing is it's, it's like a visualized thinking tool. So anything that you are, you know, any concept that you're interested in, you can type in. Uh, we've created these really uh, big sort of knowledge graphs that it can then, you know, pull from in order to then give you suggestions back that you may not have thought about. So helping with your creative exploration, really broadening uh, your concept about something. A lot of people said it helps with blind spots in their, in their knowledge, but also the AI helps against their own unconscious biases. So it really helps with that sort of in-depth exploration, research, and preparation. Um, actually visualizes it like digital sticky notes. So it's a, it's a way of kind of organizing your thoughts as well. Um, it also uh, digitizes a few design thinking tools um, called like the Six Hats, for example, or Triz or Scamper, um, specifically looking at it from uh, the perspective of helping you have different perspectives and angles um, uh, so that you're not always thinking in the same way. Um, and that's the whole point of creativity is to, to be mentally more flexible. Um, and um, apart from that, yes, yeah, so the, 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 then the next stage, obviously during incubation, we start analyzing stuff um, in a way that's relevant to the industry that you're in. So we've got these three different versions, one for innovation, that's been trained on 35 million different sources of design, engineering, science, tech, architecture, and infrastructure. So it really gives you, um, you know, suggestions within the know-how and the technical wheelhouse, say. Um, the other one, um, we call it creative, uh, but really it's, 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 you know, anybody who wants to be creative, it's, it's nothing like, you know, elitist, but it's been trained on things to do with culture, lifestyle, trends. So often, you know, creative agencies would find it useful for their next, you know, campaign and advertising or social media, but equally a songwriter or a script writer would find it useful or say a brand when they're thinking about, you know, their tone of voice or their next product. And then we've got this other third version to do with games design and experience design. So, so then it starts analyzing things um, in a way that these different industries would find useful, such as story plots, characterization, um, you know, the game player motivation, ethics, innovation, all sorts of things like that. So the idea is to um, essentially help you think, help you conceptualize, get the right idea, which you can then uh, implement and, you know, use your craft to, to make. So for example, that could be with Photoshop or, you know, you know, with your instrument or whatever it is. So this is more that stage before actually creating it with your hands, you know? Um, and then the next phase that we are, you know, taking this into is utilizing, um, uh, some of the, the, the sort of neuroscience uh, angle directly. So there was a signature brain pattern that I found um, in the musicians when they were in their creative flow. So what we're now trying to do is utilize uh, biosensors. What that, you know, that's not as scary as that sounds. It's basically things like wearables. I'm wearing one right now. This is a fancy Fitbit, for example. Um, and, you know, just as this is actually looking at heart rate, you also have very, very, um, simple, slim, you know, brain sensing wearables as well. So we're trying to collect data um, from, from, from these wearables to detect um, from, from your actual physiology, whether you're in that flow mental state or not. And we've got some deep learning AI models that can do that in real time. Why that's useful is because, you know, um, we, 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 through the deep learning, analyze the biosensor data and then show you your internal state in a very simple way. That could be a color change, something like that. Where it, you know, it can be quite hard to know whether you're in that flow state or not. You know, it could be quite hard to know whether you're focusing. It could be quite hard to know whether you're relaxing. So this is just kind of like a like a feedback to you. And then the next stage is to then gamify the whole thing. If you're not in that sort of mental state, how can we help you get into that state? It sounds like the creative terminators are only a couple of years away. Uh, hopefully we've got some time before that happens, but I've really enjoyed my time with you today. Um, if people want to find out more about you, your product, your work, what's the best place they can go to find out more? 
Yeah, I mean, and actually, if you just type in Dr. Shama Rahman in LinkedIn, you should be able to find me. Uh, and then NeuroCreate is spelled N-E-U-R-O, Neuro, and then Create. Um, we have a very specific uh, website for the AI-powered tool for, for creative teams, actually, where being uh, neurocreate.co.uk slash creative. And then we've also got one for freelancers, where instead of writing slash creative, you would go slash freelancer. So um, they're slightly different. And we're just about to, um, you know, offer offer both actually. <laughs> Fantastic! I'll make sure to get all of those links down in the description below. Dr. Raman, it's been wonderful speaking with you today, and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked it, please like, share, and subscribe, and leave me a comment about what you thought and what you'd like to see more about. If you want to take your creativity and innovation capabilities to the next level, then invest in yourself with the premium training only available at ideatovalue.com. These exclusive training modules have all been put together by me, Nick Skillicorn, and have been used by thousands of artists, innovation leaders, and CEOs to become better at understanding the source of their creativity and executing on their innovation ambitions. And there is no risk to new, as they are backed by our money-back guarantee. Now, don't forget to go out there and make your ideas a reality. See you again soon.